my subject is Job, your biography. It may never have occurred to you that you're in the Bible. In fact, the whole book is all about you. But Job truly is your biography. Many consider it the most sublime book in the Bible. And many of the truly great writers of all time see it as the greatest book in literature. Tennyson says it's the greatest story both of the ancient and modern world. Carlyle said of it, there is nothing written, I think, both in the Bible or out of the Bible that is equal to it in literary value as Thomas Carlyle. And this list could go on indefinitely, what people think of the book of Job. The book of Job is divided into three parts. There is the prologue, where it's a plot, the most ghastly plot, a cruel plot against men, a man called Job. And then comes the dialogue. And the dialogue, you can hear the scream, the anguish of the one who is passing through the experiment. And then the epilogue, where the author of the entire plot and the experiment is revealed. Here, Job is the victim of the most frightful and cruel experiment on the part of God. And the epilogue reveals and puts all responsibility for Job's misfortune on God. The 42nd chapter, which is the last chapter, the 11th verse, states it so clearly. And then they came to him, all of his brothers and sisters, and all who knew him before. And they showed sympathy and they're confident because of the evil that God has brought upon it. The first and second chapters introduces a character called Satan, but scholars discount it. That is today suspect. He's only introduced in the later manuscripts to in some strange, strange way soften the blow against the author of the play who is God. And so Satan is introduced in the first and second chapters, just in a few verses, then he disappears. He's not even brought back even in the epilogue. So there's no Satan. It's simply God is the author of this cruel experiment on man. The author tries again and again to explain the cause of human suffering. He's investigated all feelings of suffering. But as you read it, he never heard of the theme of vicarious suffering. Never heard of it. He doesn't know that it is God and God alone who is playing all the parts. He will say, God isn't suffering, I am. And in that claim, he is named the only God in the world. That God became man, that man may become God. So he doesn't know of the theme of vicarious suffering. Life begins as a problem. You want me to start it? You may come down there, we've not through. We've only just started. I say life begins as a problem. It offers a task rather than an enjoyment. Its solution 
is a faith. We do not see the answer. We must trust the answer. We do not gain the victory. We are united with the victor. For God plays the part, plays every part, and he steps beyond and redeems the individual in the body of himself, which is Christ Jesus. He plays every part, it's Christ Jesus in man, playing all the parts. At a moment unknown to the individual, he steps beyond and redeems that individual, having put him through all the furnaces of affliction. I've tried you in the furnaces of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I do it. For how shall my name be profane? For my glory I will not give to another. He can't give his glory to someone other than himself. So he prepares a seeming other and makes it conform to the image of his son and the son and the father are one. So when you are conformed to the image of the son, then he gives you his glory which is himself. Return unto me that glory. The glory I had with thee before that the world was. Give me your glory is the constant request of that hungry, painful being who fell into the seeming experiment. But it's God doing it. Now here in the beginning, the plot is laid. And it's a cruel plot. A horrible plot. And then this fabulous Arab sheep, he is an Edomite. All the characters are Edomite. So that the central character, Joe, he is an Edomite. Esau is called an Edomite. If you read it carefully, Ishmael is the Edomite. And so here we begin, it's the Edomite that seemingly is going to be tried to the extreme. In it, he is rich. He has his sons and his daughters, the most beautiful girls in all the world. A fabulous world of camels and she asses and sheep and goats, everything. Nothing but comfort, nothing but security. <clears throat> and then comes the testing. And then comes the first messenger that people punched upon the camels, destroyed the servants and took all the sheep and all the goats. Then comes the second messenger, took all the camels and slaughtered the servants. And it goes messenger after messenger after messenger. And finally, the last messenger comes and he said, all of your children were eating and drinking wine in the house, the tent of the eldest son. And then came the wind from the four corners and smashed the tent and killed all of them. And I am the only one who survived to bring the message. And then Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He brought nothing into this world, Nothing will he take out. He came in naked. He will go out naked. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in all this, Job did not sin or accuse God of any wrong. Everything was taken from him but himself. Now comes the next and the final. All right. You have taken his children. You have taken his wealth. You have taken everything. But put your finger upon the man himself and hurt him. And so then comes the boy. From the head of his foot, head of his, from his head to his foot. Nothing but boy. And everyone shuns him. He's all alone. They spit on him. They slap him. And they ignore him. They insult him. And the wife says to him, Are you still being faithful to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he says, you have spoken as any other foolish woman. Shall we not, having received the good, also receive the evil? 
And so in all these things, Job sinned not with his lips and remained just as faithful to his pledge as he had before, even though he was filled with these painful boils. And then comes the dialogue. And from then on, the second chapter on to the 42nd, Job is not patient, Job. Job is the most impatient being in the world, and that's you. Because here you believe, as I believe, as the world believes, in a law, in a world of retribution. I never get into an argument with anyone concerning the principle. But they will ask the question, well, where, where is Stalin today? Where is Hitler? Where are the tyrants of the world? Surely they're suffering. So we find in the end, Job rehearses in the most eloquent manner all of his virtues, all of his wonderful virtuous deeds, which in itself is a demonstration that he still has not abandoned the belief in the dogma of retribution. He rehearses all of his virtuous deeds, so he is asking God to bring in a verdict of acquittal. He must, for he's rehearsing what he did. And he knows that all of his sufferings are far out of proportion to all of the little things, the little so-called mistakes he might have made in this world, of which at the moment he is unaware. He still believes in retribution. And this is not the story at all. Father who sinned, or master who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man, nor his fellow, but that the work of the Lord be made manifest. A man can't quite understand this principle, that God and God alone is playing all the parts. It's not retribution. Were it not for infinite mercy, no one could be saved, because you can't earn it. No one can earn it. And yet man still believes in retribution. Surely he must be suffering six million he burned, and selling maybe twenty million he destroyed. So where is he now? And they would rejoice at the thought he was passing through even a modified fire compared to the fire he set in motion to burn the twenty million that he destroyed. And that's not the story of Job at all. Job's the victim of the most cruel experiment in the world, but in the end, the means will be justified. Be patient. Our playwright may show in some fifth act what this wild drama means. Be patient. It will be shown in the fifth act what these four acts really mean and they are violent, they are horrible. But do not let yourself be intimidated by the horror of the world. For everything is ordered and correct and must fulfill its destiny in order to achieve perfection. You follow this path and try not to complain. Try to accept it. Use God's law to disengage yourself from it and bring about a better, greater and greater world for yourself and for others. But don't complain when things fall and seemingly crush your world. You follow this path and you will see that they will lead you in to an ever deeper perception of the eternal beauty of creation. They will also disengage you from this that seems so sad and so horrible in your world. Believe in that end. Job's religion, like mine, like yours, was inherited. I have heard of thee with the hearing of the air. He hadn't seen it. No one, we do not see the answer. We must trust the answer. I have heard of thee with the hearing of the air. So I heard, mother told me, the minister told me, I heard it in school, and I heard of this faith that I had to adopt. I just heard about it. So it was all the old tradition, all the inherited religion, what the fathers had said. But in the very end, having said, I heard of thee with the hearing of the air, but now my eye sees. So while he is complaining, Job makes the statement. I will defend, I know, 
He shouts later. I know it. I know this body is going to die. And I hope you know that body is going to die in spite of what certain people tell you. That body is going to die. I know this is going to die. So Joe makes a statement, I know he shouts later. I have no hope yet. I will defend my ways before his face. And this shall be my salvation. That the godless shall not come before him. What a statement. I will defend my ways before his face. He is going to slay me, that I know. I have no hope. I will defend my ways before his face. And this shall be my salvation. Now, my salvation, why? The godless shall not come before him. Only the pure in heart can see God. And if I can defend my ways before his face, I must be standing before him. And the godless cannot stand before him. So I will approve to my own satisfaction at least. Standing before his face, I must be the pure in heart. And the pure in heart are the redeemed. He redeems the pure in heart. But he's still in that moment is justifying his behavior. And as Blake brought out, hell is simply nothing more than self-justification. Man is always justifying his behavior. All. And he is still believing at the very end in retribution. And it isn't so at all. So when he is put on the carpet, a number of questions are asked you, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Can you tell me the number of months for the hind to produce, the ass to produce, and he names all these things, and he finds how ignorant he is. He is completely ignorant, as you are, as I am, until God unveils himself, and then gives himself. Now the word Joe means, this is the meaning of it, where is my father? That's the meaning of the word Joe. Where is my father? Where is the author of my life? Where? I must find the author, the father of this horrible experiment that is taking place on me. So where is my father? And now man, by faith, is led to meet his father. And when he meets his father, he and the father are one. I and my father are one. Every one of us in this world are led in a way that we can ourselves plot and plan. No man can beat his way to the Father. He is brought to the Father by a certain pattern that only the Father can devise. It's all a pattern. I am the way. To whom? I am the way to the Father. No man comes unto the Father save by me. And this is simply a way. And the way is a series of mystical experiences that leads us in this furnace, out of the furnace to the Father. And when we go to the Father, he and I are one. In your one. You're one with the one who conceived the entire plot. To shape himself, this unbegotten shaping himself on humanity and bringing what he shaped, which is himself, out. Conform into his image. So Job is your story. It's my story. Don't look. And let your mind start delving into the depths of yourself. What have I done to warrant this? So you bring a child into the world, the child is blind. You bring a child into the world, the child is deformed. The child is not right. And then someone tells you, well, in some strange way, you and your wife or your husband, you are the cause of this misfortune. Or the child itself, based upon so-called reincarnation and so-called karma, is now reaping the fruit of some past frightfulness that he performed. Don't believe it. Can you conceive of the length of time that it would take a Hitler or a Stalin or any other tyrant to really reach the Father? No. It's a play. The whole thing is a play. And because it is a play, and one being plays all the parts, and that one being is God. And it takes all of these blows, listen to the words, he made everything for its purpose, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. But everything in the world he made for its purpose. Yes, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. And so, Job is your biography. And all the dialogue 
Now the dialogue, if you read it carefully, the friends are introduced, three friends, and they accuse him of some horror that he must have done of which he's totally unaware. He can't remember. But they're trying to justify God's law. And they say that God's law is perfect. Everything about the law is perfect. And if you are blind, you must have blinded someone. If you are maimed, you must have maimed someone. If you're now being robbed of all the things you have, you must have robbed someone. Even justice, they call it. And he said, what? Not just. He couldn't conceive. Maybe memory fails me. But I can't conceive of any of the things that I've done to warrant what has happened to me. So he denied it completely. In the story of Job, he is the only one up to that moment who ever challenged the justice of the law of God. No one ever challenged it before. Everyone accepted that the law was a just law. And here Job is the first one to challenge the justice of God. Even-minded justice, said they. And he said, no, nonsense that. There is no even-minded justice. I can conceive of it, for I know what I did. I have no memory of the past, but I can't believe it. So Job is telling us that when you see someone deformed in the world, someone maimed in this world, don't for one moment think that he or she set it in motion. It's a necessary part of the furnace that God has prepared in the beginning of time to send himself through to produce pure gold to awaken as God. It is not anyone who did it as a man. So if I today should sire a little child, and the child comes in main, comes in in any way limited, if I know Job, Job is telling me it is the work of God that I, the father, and my wife, the mother, we are not the cause of the misfortune of this that came. And what came is Job. And what is Job? Looking for his father. Where is my father? Who fathered this? Not this thing called Neville. Where is my father? What is the cause of this misfortune? Well, that's the name of Job. Where is my father? He's asking for God. And God is playing the part. So in the story, although he tried time and again to justify the cause of the misfortune of life and sought all the theories about the cause of the so-called suffering, he never heard of the theme of vicarious suffering, where God himself is suffering. It is God who plays all the part. So when someone will say, but he isn't doing it, I am suffering, he just at that very moment named the one who really is suffering. And God's only name is I am. So what I am suffering, I have the two things. I have the disappointment. I have the pain. I have the embarrassment. My child performed a certain action which has caused me great embarrassment. And so who is suffering? I am, I say. Well, that's God. That's his name. He has no other name. And so the story of Job is the story of the great play that we see in the world, the most horrible play in the world. But the end will justify the means devised by God to bring us all up as himself. God is acting, God the unbegotten, shaping himself on this mold called humanity, bringing himself up as God. It may seem strange when everyone wants to point and say, well now, he's worthy of it, or it serves him right. You hear it morning, noon, and night, it serves him right. I know him, you think you know him, but no, he doesn't serve him right. If he is now in some unfortunate state, don't for one moment go along that strange concept of reincarnation, where he, in some previous life, he did what he did, or maybe in this life, so he's now reaping the fruit of that seeming misfortune. That's not the story of Job. So here's a prologue, and you cannot get away from the author. The author is God. The end tells you who caused the suffering of Job. And here, let me quote it for you, the 11th verse, the 42nd chapter, the last book or last chapter of Job. And they all came to him, all the brothers, all the sisters, and all who knew him before. 
and they ate bread with him in his house, and they showed sympathy, and they comforted him, because of all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Not any Satan, not any devil, the Lord had brought upon him. You can rub out completely the word Satan in the document that has been inserted by some scribe to take away and blunt the great truth that the book is trying to reveal. God is the only author of this play. He has no co-author. He has no co-actor. He's playing all the parts. And the aim will justify the means. He had to put us through the furnaces of affliction because he couldn't give us or give himself to us until we were as pure as he is. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You must be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So man has to be made holy. And not a thing can do it but the furnaces of, of affliction, called the furnaces of experience. And you and I pass through them from the cradle to the grave. And beyond the grave, because it doesn't end when we're called dead. The wheel is larger than three score and ten years. It goes beyond that. But in God's own good time, we are taken from the furnaces. He calls us one by one and gives us himself. And that gift of God to us is revealed in a series of mystical experiences, which is called the way in the New Testament. And the story of Jesus Christ and everything said of him, take every event in his life as a sign. And you individually will experience everything said of Jesus Christ, his birth, right through to the ascension. And at the ascension, you are ascended into the great Zion, or the city of God. And everyone will ascend into that place. But you can't ascend until God in his own good time calls you from the furnaces. When in his eye, you're purified. Completely purified. Last night, I dined with a friend of mine. And here a week ago, I told the story of God being the grand keeper of the furnace. And that man, the individual, is purified by the death of his delusion. And that man cannot plot the death of the delusion. God does it. I may think I can plot it and overcome a certain prejudice. Say I dislike a certain race, or a certain religion, or a certain something else. And I think I can work on myself and overcome it. I can't do it. It is God who plots it. And he told me the most wonderful story. He said, you know, I actually hate it. I didn't dislike. I hate it. And he named two hates in his life. While he was in the last war. And he had an opportunity that God had plotted for him to overcome the two hates. He said he was in New Guinea. And here he was pinned down with a Japanese fire. That the very slightest raise of his head beyond that foxhole and the bullet ricochet off of his metal cap. And they're all pinned down with this machine net. And over here to his side was a soldier, a Jew, one of his hates, where he had given him as a sergeant, he gave him fatigue duties and all kinds of duties in excess of what he should have done because he hated him. And the Jew said to him, Sir, do you have a few grenades? And he could sneak to him three grenades. And this Jew braved the fire of the Japanese men and simply exposed himself as the sergeant didn't do, and no one else would do. And he, the private, the Jew, wiped out the entire Japanese net with these grenades, offering himself as the top. He was wounded, but it was not fatal. And the sergeant overcame his hate when he saw what the Jew had done. He was going to sacrifice himself to save his own men when they're all pinned down by this net of Japanese snipers and machine guns. Then said he, I also hated the Negro. And I had a company of Negroes. And they broke ranks, exposed my flanks, and our company was decimated. They completely, by breaking ranks and running like cowards, they exposed me and my company. We were really decimated. 
I lost many wonderful men. But I came back after the war, and I had an accident in the factory. And here I am burning. My back is burning, my pants are burning, they're all aflame. And the Caucasian didn't come to save me. One Negro man rushed and gave himself. He could have been burned to death. He put out the flames on me with himself. And then I overcame my oppressor for the Negro. Who could have done that but God? So God put him in a certain position. So you think that he had warranted being burned alive? No, God was plotting it to purify his heart to overcome a prejudice which was the hate of the Negro. And in the other case, here was a Jew on his side. The Jew wasn't killed, but had he been killed, possibly in his own heart, even a greater love would have gone out to the entire Jewish race, because one gave himself to protect everyone else. No one else rose to throw these grenades at the Japanese net, but the Jew did. And he was the private, and here was the sergeant. So I say, only God can plot these things, and that's the story of Job. And every moment, from the second chapter to the 42nd, he is pleading and asking why. He doesn't understand why he must suffer as he suffering. And God does not answer him until the very end. He can't see God. And then suddenly God comes from out of the whirlwind and asks him, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where were you when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you? He can't answer. He sees his own ignorance concerning creation. And yet he dares to challenge the creator, the father of it all. But then in the very end, who is criticized? Not Job. His friends for justifying falsely the behavior of God as a lord of retribution. And so they are condemned for their false claims concerning a God of retribution. And Job is free. Even all this criticism, all that is forgiven. And then he is given twice what he had before. But bear in mind, Job's release came by the change in the heart of Job towards his friends. When Job prayed for his friends, his own captivity was lifted. And to pray for another is to repent. Repentance is a radical change of attitude towards life. So I hated someone, a radical change of life, radical change of attitude towards the Jew. And that man in the foxhole of New Guinea, he repented. Not in a church, in a foxhole. He changed his attitude radically towards the Jew. Then in the factory when he's about to be burned to death, he changed his attitude towards the Negro. That man was Job. And man's release comes when he prays for a friend. And so a prayer, in this sense, is simply a radical change of attitude towards a certain event in this world, or a certain person, or race, or nation. So I tell you, Job is your history. Read it carefully. It's the most misquoted book in Scripture, and undoubtedly the least read. I wonder how many present here have read the book, or if you have read it, how often have you read it? And yet, you're reading, when you read Job, you're reading your own biography. There are 42 chapters. And I tell you, as I told you earlier, this solution comes by a faith. Not by any other way. You can't earn it, just by a faith. I told you last night of my own experience. I won't repeat it tonight, but I tell you, believe it, have faith in this series of experiences. It comes that way. If you heard it, and you believe it, I promise you the day will come when you least expect it, the series will start in you. And when it starts, it leads you straight to God the Father, and then you know the meaning of Job. Where is my Father? That's all that he's asking. Where is my Father? And then he goes, and he finds that he himself is the Father. In the depth of himself, he was dreaming himself into being, and put himself through these horrible experiences in this world for a divine purpose that he would awaken to find himself God. And so no one here can awaken until he goes through the entire furnace. And when he goes through the furnace, he's brought out of the furnace and he's the very being who dreamed the whole thing into being. He's God. 
So that is Job. Where is my father? Now there's a story told in Job, I think it's the 11th chapter. A stupid man will get understanding when a man is born the coat of a wild ass. Or when a wild ass's coat is born a man. Now you ask, isn't that stupid? A stupid man will get understanding when the wild ass's coat is born a man. Does scripture in any way throw light on it? It does. In the 16th of Genesis. And the name is Ishmael. And Ishmael is really called a wild ass of a man. Well, the word ass in scripture is defined as torment, ferment, a red glow, or the bubbling up in redness. That's the ass. Ishmael, if you know scripture, was the first offspring of Abraham, born not of Sarah, but born of Hagar, the pilgrim, the slave. This is Ishmael. And so is the garment we're wearing now. It is a red glow. It's filled with blood. Every man and woman of the world is Ishmael. That's the first statement of it, the prototype of Esau, who was called the red one, the red blooded one. These are the outer garments. These are the wild asses called the Edomites. And here, the stupid man will get on the sentence when the wild ass's coat is born a man. What do you mean born a man? I've been born a man, and this is the Ishmael, this is the Esau. But it takes this, with all the fires and the horrors that go through this garment of mine, with all the pain, to produce something that is hidden. The something hidden, first one was Isaac, and then you have the fourth side, the next one was Jacob, and the next one was David, and the next was Jesus Christ. It comes through and finally the hidden being that has been molded and molded by the pains of this seeming outer God. And finally it's brought into being and it is God. So this is the red glow. This garment, this is the Ishmael. This is the Esau. And is it not predicted even before he's born? Is it not that two nations are housed within my breast? One to heaven that aspire and one to earth that cling? And it was predicted before the birth of these two that one should serve the other, that the one that comes first called Esau would serve the second called Jacob. Is it not that John would serve Jesus Christ? And is it not that Ishmael would be banished and Isaac would come, though he came second? Well, this comes first into the world, but how is within it is that that is being slowly molded into the likeness of God, and it must conform to the image of his only begotten Son. And when it's completely conformed to that image, or it's perfect, fully made, then it comes out, and you're God. So here, you are Job, and you are looking for the Father, and you're asking morning, noon, and night, where is my Father? And one day the Father will reveal himself to you, and he's just like you. Exactly like you. When he reveals himself, he is just like you. You're being molded into his image, and he is raised to the nth degree of perfection, and so will you be. And the day will come that you are one with him, and then you are fused with him, and you and he are one. So the prologue states this horrible, horrible experiment. In spite of what others will tell you, I tell you, read the carefully, you can't find any reason. For the experiment says that God conceived it. It's a cruel experiment on an innocent being. You are the innocent being. And the 42nd chapter tells you exactly who he is. And it's not any Satan, it is God. God devised the plot, and he took himself through the entire play. And he comes out and reveals himself as the one who conceived it, the one who played it, and the one who then gave you himself. It's by carrying suffering. So he reveals himself, and then you receive the glory, which is God. Read it carefully. There are only 42 chapters. 
is not a long book. You can read it tonight in less than 20 minutes. Or less than 15 minutes. You can read it with understanding. If you heard tonight with understanding and believed it, read it through tonight's eyes as you heard tonight's interpretation of Job. And see how it fits you. For are there things in your world that you can't see why it happened? What family in this world, if a large family, has a someone? Take our president. He has a sister who is mentally backward. Why? And some priest will tell him, because in some strange way, a lord of retribution has made your sister suffer this way. Don't believe it. I hope he doesn't. No, it is part of the great play. The ninth chapter of the Gospel of John teaches who sins, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God be made manifest. So let no one tell you when someone comes to your world, handicapped, that in any way this is the law of retribution. Don't believe it. It's a play. And in the very end, it will be revealed to you in the fifth act. So be patient. Our playwright may show in some fifth act what this wild drama means. And he will. And then you will see everyone will come out and everyone will be perfect. And all will be God. Nothing but God. For it takes this most horrible play as described in Job to produce it. It's the most sublime of the books of scripture. Because you can't understand how a man so honest, faithful, never once condemned God. I came naked from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. I brought nothing with me, I'll take nothing with me. God gave, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So in all these things, he sinned not and did not claim that God was born. And when the wife said, curse him and die, O foolish woman, you speak like all foolish women. Should I receive the good at the hand of God and not also the evil? So in all these things, he sinned not. He remained just as faithful to it all. And then comes the blows. For he's only questioning. He's asking why, why, why. To the very end. And then he makes the confession. His religion was inherited. He heard of it with the hearing of the air. But now my eye sees it. And when you see it, and everything tells you that you accept it on faith, you experience the child in your own hand who smiles. The serpent. Everything told you that you could only accept on faith. You experience. So I have heard of all this with the hearing of the air. But now, my eye sees it. I experience it. I know it to experience it. And then the curtain comes down, and then his fortunes are restored a hundredfold. And he's one with the one he's been seeking. Where is my father? I have found him, and I am my father the one. Self-begotten. You are self-begotten. But you are in the process of being begetting. And so, you will one day be completely begotten. And when you're begotten, you're self-begotten. And it's God begetting himself. And you're he. Now let us go into the silence for a moment. Now I trust that it is not in your future to be heard. It's my wish for you. But do remember what you heard tonight. Should you be heard, don't feel in any strange way that there is a God of retribution. It's only for your good that these things happen. As we are told in Job, if I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with love, then thou cast me into the pit and my own clothes are for me. So no matter how man tries to cleanse himself morally and do all these things in order not to encounter the pit, if the pit is necessary to purify 
in order to be made perfect in the eyes of God, he will be thrown into the pit. You see it every day. And you wonder why. I knew him. He was so altogether nice and kind and tender. I knew the family. Why should it happen to them? But that's the story of Job. So all any questions, please. Surely there's a question. Very good question. The lady does not relate this to the way I express imagination. I say, in the midst of the pain, you was God's love. Certainly. If tonight I found myself completely behind the eight ball, because that is part of my training, then that be with God's law. And exercise my talent to come out of that pit. I don't accept it as final. I don't even accept it as temporary. But I mustn't blame myself when I find myself in the pit. That is told us so clearly in the gospel. Do you think that when the tower fell and killed 18, they were greater sinners than the others in Jerusalem? I tell you not. But unless you repent, you shall have the same fate. Repent means change of attitude. Everything is to force a man to exercise his talent, to change his attitude. Do you think that the five who were killed in Galilee, that they were worse sinners than the others? I tell you not. But unless you repent, you will have a similar faith. The word is repent. That's the beginning of the whole teaching. Repent only means that word metanoia, a radical change of attitude towards life. So when something happens to you, don't accept it as final. Repent. But he'll throw it on you morning, noon, and night and force you to exercise your talent. He will promise if it takes a wall a new guinea, a new on your belly, and bullets ricocheting off your hat to prove to you that your prejudice was simply a mental error. And therefore, one that you disliked and hated would be your savior. So man's purification comes by the death of his delusions, and he always will use the one you hate to be your good Samaritan. Always. So the Jew in one case was a good Samaritan, the Negro in the other case was his good Samaritan. Both hated On different occasions. If he has another hate today, God will put him in the state and then he'll be saved by one of his hate. And that one will be his good Samaritan. So I do not deny what I tell you. Imagining creates reality. But don't deny when you go through there. I came down Mason many years ago. I was living at the Fairmont. And it was a wet day, and I came up with new shoes. But you know that thing called me. But here I am, I'm aware ahead of my date. In fact, the lady's in the audience now. I have a date with her for an early hour. I think it was 10.30. And so I started down towards her shop on Post Avenue. I mean, on, on Post Street. But I was quite early. I started. And someone would have taken me right up this way and dropped me on my back. But it felt that way. And there I was completely on my back, walking down with my new shoes. And then two lads came by and they left me to the top of California. And then I was in excruciating pain. I had a little date that night at the Fairmont. I had 18 invited to get uh, to dinner. And luckily I knew the housekeeper and she thought well, she was pitching and helped me out by taking them through these fabulous apartments in the Fairmont after dinner because I couldn't stand any longer. And she said, I'll take them to Mr. Kaiser's place, and I'll take them to this place, and show them these fabulous uh, suites in the hotel. It was very sweet about it. Because I couldn't sit one moment as long as I did. I was excruciating pain. So I told the story from the platform. First reaction was, why should it happen to you? As though I am not part of the society. Am I not part of the world? It happens to me as it happens to anyone. 
It could happen to President Kennedy. If he falls on his back, which he did, he's always walking on the chair. Why should it happen to him? He's ahead of our country. Here is the top office in the land, and he is filling it. But something happened to him, and he's always walking. So, don't in any way justify it. Use your imagination to get out of it. I didn't look to say, what have I done to warrant this? God shouldn't do this to me. I'm doing his work. Well, isn't that stupid? So who isn't doing his work? The man who sho- uh, took my, shy- my shoes today and shined them for me. He's doing God's work. I didn't shine them myself. And so he shined my shoes for me. He's doing God's work. But everyone said, well, why should it happen to Neville? Well, it happened to me, may I tell you. And I had that pain for excruciating pain, but it forced me to use my imagination to get out of that pain. So why shouldn't it happen to me? Must it only happen to others? We're all one. So I say this is not in contradiction with what I teach. Imagine it creates reality. But the story is repaint, repaint, repaint. When you find yourself, don't start digging and say, look, what have I done as Job did? Job, in the most glorious, in the 30th chapter, 30th and 31st chapters of Job, he makes the most eloquent defense of his virtues. And all of his virtues he brings up and all the virtuous deeds. For that is a demonstration of the fact he had not abandoned his belief in the dogma of retribution. And yet he's asking for acquittal. How can he be acquitted if he believes in retribution? These things could not have happened if he believed that way. But in spite of these things, God puts them on. And then, repent. Don't ask me why I did it. Repent. Don't accept the sentence. Get out of it. Don't accept any sentence. You get out of it by exercising your talent that I gave you. And then extricate yourself from that problem. For man has to awaken. But don't accept it and don't look for some cause other than God's uh, vision of the need of that bit of gold. There's still a little bit of ore with it and it must be burned away. So it doesn't deny the claim that imagining creates reality. What I'm trying to get over tonight, don't judge people harshly when you meet someone who is limited. If they're limited, tell them of repentance. But don't condemn them and say, well now, you're only reaping the fruit of some horrible mistake in the past. Don't. Just say, no matter what they've ever done in the past, tell them how to escape from their present predicament. Because God is infinitely merciful. And he did not know of a God of mercy. He only knew of a God of retribution. And God is a God of mercy. And God is a God of grace. And so he gives us in the end, after we exercise the talent that he gave us, which is just to free ourselves from every limitation in the world. Any other questions, please? Well, you do. You see that again? That man can't get over that uh, law of retribution. He can't get over it. We are still playing the Bible. The Bible is not something that is thousands of years old. The Bible is contemporary. Man is in the state of consciousness of getting even, retribution. And he comes to forgive sin. Completely forgive everything. The last cry on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But man doesn't want to forgive them. They say, where is Stalin? I hope he's burning. Where is Hitler? I hope he's burning. And to say, well, no, he's not. Why, millions would simply feel, but that isn't a good God. I don't want a God that forgives sin. I don't want a God of mercy. Not until he first burns this one first. Then after he burns him, well, then he can forgive sin. But not before. And that's the world. But he isn't that kind of a God. He is a God of infinite mercy. And he's showing us a law. If you have a piece of gold and you want to mold it into a certain image, a living image, but the gold is not pure gold, there's a little alloy with it, a little ore, and you can only really put it into a molten form by putting it into fire. Wouldn't that go, if it really had sensitivity, be in pain when you put it in the fire? Would it? I mean, if you could endow the gold with a, a sensitive quality, would it not be hurt if you put it in the fire? All right. 
but you put it in fire to bring it into a molten state that it may separate itself from the drop. And when it's completely pure and in the molten state, then you can put it into any form you want, couldn't you? Well, that is man. When God took himself a handful of clay and hid in it the torment of eternity, he got himself a turmoil. He hid it. Did not Job say, and you made this clay of mine, made me out of clay, or you would at once more turn me into dust? Because to him it felt like being turned into dust. You made me out of clay, or you would have turned me into dust? Said Job. So when you go through the furnaces, you think you're being turned into dust. You're being 